happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Good to see such shining faces. Amen. Amen. What welcome. Thanks. Welcome. Welcome to Metal Grace this morning. Amen. And there's just a few announcements that we would like to bring to your attention. First of all, masks are required at all times. Uh, and the chairs are six feet apart unless you are a member of a family. We do ask that you stay seated once you've chosen where you're going to sit because we need to, we need to make sure we clean all the chairs, the volunteers that, that have volunteered to work with us. And uh, we ask that you don't socialize in here. If you want to socialize, we ask that you do it out on the parking lot. For the restrooms, they're just outside this door, as you know. We ask that you do it one at a time, but if somebody just can't wait, then there's the two bathrooms down the end of the hallway through that door. Please follow all posted signs and directions. And next week, uh, we'll be down here again. But please, if you plan to come, please RSVP and, uh, so that we know how many people are coming. Your Sabbath school quarterlies and other literature is on the table when you go out. Please pick it up and, and proceed directly outside. Hand sanitizers are on the walls. And if you're on this side, we ask that you use this door to go out. If you're on this side, we ask that you use that door to go out. Please don't, don't use this door to go out. This door is for coming in only. Thanks so much. Have a good Sabbath. And may God richly bless you. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody. It's so good to see all of you here today. Um, our scripture reading for today will be found in Psalm chapter 32, verses 6 through 8. That's Psalm 32, 6 through 8. And it says, For this cause everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Please bow your heads for a word of prayer with me. Father, thank you for bringing each and every one of us here today. And Lord, please with all of us who are joining in from YouTube as well, thank you that we have this time just to worship with one another and to learn more about you, Father. Be with us each and every day that we might be lights to others, to those who we work with, those who we go to school with, those around us each and every day. Please be with all those who are affected by this pandemic, Lord, in whatever way. Please heal all those who are sick and in need. Thank you for all that you do, and you know we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Good afternoon. I am not going to invite you to kneel. I am going to invite you to recharge prayer meeting this Wednesday at 6.30. And um, this will be right here in this same building room right now. They got some competition here, huh? No, he's better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, first of all, is there any prayer requests? I got a few times to take a few prayer requests for any right now. Is there any special requests? Just raise your hands. Solid request. All right, let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. You're so beautiful. There's no other to have the compassion that you have, the love that you have for us. And Lord, we thank you so much for your forgiveness, for your creation, for your creation. And Lord, we are so blessed that you are our God. No other God that gives like you do because you're the only God. You give us new beginnings. And we love you. We're here to worship you, give you honor and glory and praise and enjoy in your beauty. We're so thankful, Lord, for this day that you've created for us to enjoy to be with you all day long. We look forward, Lord, to it each and every week. Lord, we ask that you do keep the virus away from this building. Our confidence in you that you will take care of it and you will accomplish it. Keep us all well and strong. And Lord, as we <coughs> think about the future, how do we spread this gospel during this time? We count on your wisdom to give us different ideas to do this, like through the internet or some kind of way like that. And Lord, we thank you that Rick LeBade is here today. And Bruce Ann, I haven't seen her in a while. Lord, Bless him. You already gave him the words. Help it to be plain and easy to understand for all of us. Thank you for the confidence that he has in you. And Lord, we go forward looking to what wonderful things you have planned for us next week and in the future. What a wonderful life you have planned for us, new heaven and new earth. Great is your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Again, we're happy that our associate pastor could be here today. <laughs> uh, right. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. And uh, there's one announcement I did forget to remind you of, that uh, your offering, when you leave, offering plates at the door. We won't take up an offering, but when you leave, offering plates at the door, please drop them in, in the plates. Uh, the time is yours. Thank you, Dan, and good afternoon, Elbridge. Good afternoon. Yeah, things are different, aren't they? Yes, they are. Uh, man, whoever thought at the beginning of the year, in September, we'd be meeting in the Fellowship Hall of Middlebridge Church, and everybody would be very masked. And we're just trying to figure this out, aren't we? Um, Shot, where'd you go? There you go. I appreciate what you said in your prayer about, um, you know, the, the message still goes forward. It, it, it's different. We, we can't do evangelism the way we used to. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's a good thing. You know, maybe God is doing something new among us. Amen. And we're just kind of in this uncomfortable, awkward phase that we don't quite know what that is yet. And we need to discover that um, people need Jesus more than they ever did before. And the fact that the pandemic is here doesn't change that. In fact, it may accelerate it and emphasize it. And uh, things are different. I, you probably have seen many different uh, things on the internet regarding uh, COVID-19. But one of the funniest that my wife shared with me um, from Facebook was a woman who said, I never thought I would live to see the day that I would go into a bank wearing a mask asking for money. <laughs> and that's where we are. Uh, another one that kind of tickled my funny bone was somebody saw, you know how when you buy a product, you always give it one to five stars, you know, to the product. And somebody had done the years, um, 
we just selected various years, 2020 got one star. <laughs> and I guess we could probably understand and relate to that because it is very interesting and challenging times that we find ourselves in. Amen. We have this COVID-19 that has just absolutely rocked the world. And with that, we have also had the repercussions of economic challenges. Um, we live in a world where it's not just a pandemic, but right now we have a lot of societal unrest that is also going on in our country especially. It's a political year. And the, the political divisions are more palpable than I remember in my lifetime. And I'm 61 years old, so I've been around for a little while. But uh, we also have that going on. Uh, we have anxiety and stress that has been elevated because of everything. People are fearful. There's a loss of normalcy. Uh, like one author said, it feels like our country is having a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably a very appropriate metaphor for what we're experiencing. And yet, God is still on his throne. Amen. 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 Jesus is still Lord. Right. He has not abandoned us. This did not catch God by, by surprise, saying, oh no, what do I do now? Amen. So there is a message of hope that we can have, yeah, right. even when things are completely upside down. And it's a message of hope that I think is, at least for me anyway, it's easy to talk about the bad stuff in the dark times and go, oh no. And that will maybe help us understand emotionally where people are, but we can't stay there. We need a message of hope even more. And that's what I really want to bring to you today is a message of hope. Acknowledging that times are rough. The Bible even tells us that there's going to be rough times and there have been rough times, but we don't stay there. We because we know there's something better. We know that God is on his throne. We know that there is hope. And as I was saying to a fellow in Lowe's a few weeks ago when I went there and we were waiting for my wife to show up because her vehicle held this cabinet that we were buying and my car wouldn't. And we got on the topic of, um, of what's going on. And I turned to him and I said, you know what, Benny? And I got to know him just a little bit at Lowe's. I said, what do people do right now who don't know God? What do they hold on to? What do they wake up and say, you know what, I can get through today because I know God. But if you don't have that, what are they, what are they holding on to? What is their hope? Where is their foundation? Where is something that they stand on and say, I'm going to be okay because? And so... When you know Jesus and you know God is still on his throne, all of this still has uh, effects, no doubt about it. But we are able to see past this and hold on to something through it. Amen. That those who don't understand that, I feel for them. Amen. And so therefore, our urgency to help people to know God has been elevated. Amen. We just have to figure out how to do that now yes. and really, really trust God and be open and say, God, you know, we used to do things this way and we can't do that anymore, so teach us, help us. And so with that kind of um, words in my heart this morning, I'd like to get into the main message. And I want to begin with a story that's funny. Is that okay to share a funny story right now? Is it okay to laugh again still? <laughs> okay, good. Well, this story is about two New York, New, New York, excuse me, <clears throat> entrepreneurs who decided to see if there was money that could be made by introducing bungee jumping to the country of Mexico. Now, we never say Mexico. That's important to understand here. So they fronted some venture capital to build a tall platform where people who like extreme sports or adrenaline junkies could dive off and then spring up and down from those straps that hold them around the ankle as we do here in the States. So when it came time for the trial run to demonstrate it to the people down in Mexico, 
the two entrepreneurs climbed up a platform and they started to see the crowd that was gathering down at the bottom of this platform and they knew what they had to do. They had to demonstrate because those people are looking up and thinking, what are those idiots doing on this platform up there? And so they flipped the coin. And whoever won or lost, depending on how you interpret that, put on the harness and dove off. So the person who was the one to jump off put on the harness, dove off the platform, and momentarily was suspended just above the crowd before the springs brought him back up. Well, when he went back up to the platform, his partner noticed that his nose was bloody. Mm. And so down he went again, because that's what you do when you bungee jump, you go up and down. And when he came up the second time, his partner noticed that he now had a black eye. Mm. <laughs> down he went again, and when he came up the third time, his partner noticed that he now had two teeth missing. Mm. And so his partner yelled out and said, are you okay? And he said, I don't know. What's a piñata? <laughs> <laughs> and so they interpreted it as, this is an opportunity, you hit it with a stick. Well, while it may be just a little humorous story, it does symbolize something very, very real that we are experiencing right now. And that is this. Have you ever felt? Like, life was treating you like a piñata at the end of a bungee cord. Mm -hmm. You fall, and just to top it off for good measure, when you're at your lowest point, you get hit. Mm -hmm. Only to rise again for a brief time to go back down again and get hit again. Mm -hmm. Well, folks, if you don't know this by now, life is hard. Yes, yes. yes it is. There's no doubt about it. But we're going to see in a passage that we're going to explore this morning in God's Word, if we can keep the difficulty of life in perspective. And if you have Bibles or a smartphone or an iPad or whatever, if you have something that has the Scriptures, I invite you to open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 8. And this is Paul kind of recapping a bit as to what he's been going through. And this is what he writes. Everywhere we go, we have trouble. But we're not discouraged. We're perplexed. But we don't give up. We're persecuted, but never abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. We have faced death for the Lord Jesus many times, and the scars on our bodies show it. But we are still alive, which testifies to the resurrection power of Christ to deliver us from death. While we are constantly being persecuted and threatened with imprisonment and execution, the power of Christ can be seen sustaining our bodies. So while death stalks us everywhere, new life is working in you. Because of him, we never give up. Even though physically we're wearing out, yet every day, new life and determination spring up inside of us. The few troubles we're having at this moment, and I, I just have to pause for just a moment and chuckle. We just heard everything he was talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Facing death, persecution, being me, etc., things, and the few troubles. Mm -hmm. That's what he calls them. The few troubles that we're having right now are not to be compared with the far more glorious, important future. We're not looking at things we can see, but as things unseen by humans. What we see around us is temporary and will soon be destroyed, but that which can't be seen now will last forever. Amen. Amen. All right. So there's our passage. There's three things I want to bring out in this passage. The first one is this. Life is hard, but, as Paul just said, Jesus is with them. Amen. God is with them. They're not going through it alone. 
And again, he lists the severe trials that he and his fellow workers of the gospel are facing. Trouble everywhere they go. Feeling perplexed. Persecution. Having to face death. Threatened with imprisonment and execution. Physically wearing out. Well, we can probably identify with one of those on the list. And if we can't, we can probably come up with our own list. Right? <laughs> and we have to face the honest fact that being a Christian is not an antidote to problems. That's right. Amen. It's not a preventative measure against trials. That's right. In fact, sometimes it's the opposite. Yes. Christians die at exactly the same rate as everybody else. Yes. 100%. <laughs> but we have something that we can hold on to. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, if you want to turn to that, this is a verse of scripture that we often hear during the, uh, the Christmas season. Matthew 1, 23, after we read all about the genealogy excuse me, of Jesus, we read these words. A young woman who is still a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. She will call him Emmanuel, meaning what? God with us. God is with us. God is with us. What we can hold on to, folks, is that we are not going through anything alone. Amen. We're not forgotten. We're not forsaken. And God is present even when we may not realize it or sense it. Now, there is an assumption on our part that if we have a close walk with Christ, we're going to feel these constant 24-7 warm fuzzies of Jesus being with us. Uh, no. No. I want you to turn to the book of Luke for a moment as we unpack that concept in a couple of different ways. At the end of the book of Luke, in chapter 24, there's a really neat story. It's the story of the two disciples walking through Emmaus after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Starting at verse 13 in Luke 24, we read this. On that same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking to each other about all the things that had happened. And as they talked and discussed, Jesus himself drew near and walked along with them. They saw him, but somehow did not recognize him. Jesus said to them, what are you talking about to each other as you walk along? They stood still with, what kind of faces? Sad faces. And one of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening here these last few days? And I could just see the twinkle in Jesus' eye and the smile on his face when he goes, what things? <laughs> <laughs> the things that have happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. And you can almost hear them say, you idiot, don't you know what's going on? And anyway, this man was a prophet, they continue on, by and was considered by God, by all the people, to be powerful in everything he said and did. Our chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and he was crucified. And we had hoped, we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to set Israel free. And besides all that, this is now the third day since it happened. Now that's a great story, but it really comes to life when you look at it backwards. What in the world am I talking about? In verse 21, 17, and 15, what was the, their state of mind in verse 21? Take a look if you don't remember. Verse 21, how are they feeling? Sad. Sad. Well, that's actually a little later. In verse 21, they're feeling hopeless. hopeless. Right? Now, verse 17, they were feeling what? Sad. 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 You got it. Okay. Verse 21, they're feeling hopeless. Verse 17, they're feeling sad, but Jesus had come in in verse 15. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. If they had recognized that Jesus was with them in verse 15, 
Would they have been sad in 17 and hopeless in verse 21? No. No. I agree with you. So, maybe what we need to learn is this. That yes, we may feel sad and hopeless at times. We're human after all. However, would some of that hopelessness and sadness go away if we had the eyes of faith to know that Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, is there even if we can't sense his presence? Amen. Amen. This concept of God being with us, even when we may not be aware of his presence, was not new with the disciples. There's an interesting story way back in the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 28, if you want to turn there. We're not going to read it. I'm just going to actually read one verse in that. But it's the story of Jacob's dream where he sees this ladder going from earth to heaven and angels going up and down on it. And when he wakes up in verse 16, he says this, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know, I did not know that. I was not even aware of it. So again, God being present and not being aware. So let me ask you this. If God's presence was with Jacob and he wasn't aware of it, and Jesus was walking with the disciples to Emmaus and they didn't know it, what about us? Do we have the eyes of faith to know that God is with us simply because he said he would be, even if we can't sense his presence? Amen. 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 If we're looking for warm fuzzies to be the proof that God is with us, and we depend upon that feeling, and we're not going to believe that God is with us unless we have that feeling, all I can say is, Good luck with that. Mm. How's that working for you? One of my favorite Christian authors writes this. Job, Abraham, Habakkuk, and his fellow prophets, as well as many of the heroes of faith mentioned in Hebrews 11, endured long droughts when miracles did not happen, when urgent prayers dropped back to earth unanswered, when God seemed not just invisible, but wholly absent. We who follow in their path today may sometimes experience times of unusual closeness when God seems responsive to our every need. We may also, however, experience times when God stays silent and all the Bible's promises seem glaringly false. And yet, in God's word, we read Psalm 139, verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. Matthew 28, 20. Jesus said, listen, behold, I am with you even till when? The end, the end of the earth. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. So when God is silent, it doesn't mean he's not there. Amen. In fact, it could be that he's up to something. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. Let me give you an example of what I mean when I say think about it. If you're a parent, you're going to understand exactly what I'm talking about. I remember when I was about 13 years old, my best friend in church was Glenn. And on Sabbath afternoons, we'd go over to his house, and we'd find all kinds of things to keep us occupied. And we'd be up in his room, and we'd be making noise and, you know, doing whatever. And his parents were fine. But as soon as we got quiet, you know what? One of them would walk to the bottom of the stairs and ask a question. It went something like this. What are you guys up to up there? Isn't that interesting? As long as we were making noise, they were fine. But when we got quiet, mm -hmm. that's when they thought we were up to something. Mm -hmm. What if we were to adopt the same approach with God? That when he's seemingly quiet, we adopt the mindset, oh, he must be up to something. <laughs> 
He must be doing something really special. I love the way this professor um, at Washington Adventist University writes in an, uh, says it, excuse me, in an article that he wrote for Ministry Magazine. Listen to this. We must not be careful to fall into the temptation of, experience, of expecting God to relate to us in the one and single way we favor. The lives of some people of faith, like Joseph and Esther, demonstrate that the apparent, the apparent absence of God is in reality God's invisible presence that works behind the scenes. The silence of God teaches us to let go of our expectations and demands for what God should do to us and build our relationship with Him on faith and trust. Walking by faith means not surrendering to doubts and feelings of desolation, but acting on one's convictions. Though sometimes believers may have special feelings of nearness of God, Feelings are not the ultimate measure of God's presence. Amen. All right. Second thing I want to point out in this passage that we looked at, 2 Corinthians 4. Life is hard, but God is faithful. Amen. God Amen. is faithful. What is it that enables us to experience the goodness of God in the midst of life's greatest tribulations? It's because God has promised to be faithful to his children. To quote um, this author, again, Philip Yancey, by the way, is the one who I quoted earlier, one of my favorite authors. He's really helped me in my walk. He writes this. A faithful person sees life from the perspective of trust, not fear. Bedrock faith allows me to believe that despite the chaos of the present moment, God does reign, that regardless of how worthless I may feel, I truly matter to a God of love that no pain lasts forever, no evil triumphs in the end, and faith sees even the darkest deed of all history, the death of God's own Son, as a necessary prelude to the brightest. Mm. Allow me to give an example of how life is hard, but God is faithful, and what we need to do in crisis times. Back in 2009, I checked something off of my bucket list. It was called skydiving. I never skydived before, but I knew that this one time I was going to do it to check off my bucket list. I was not just going to do the thing where you're strapped to a professional skydiver and go along for the ride. I want to do it myself. <laughs> and so there is an airport between, between here and Williamsburg, about halfway, called West Point Airport. And they were one of the very, very few airports that will allow a, a novice skydiver to be trained to skydive on their own. And so I set the date for that. It was a Sunday summer morning, and I drove down. And before they let you do that, you have to go through um, a six-hour training course. In that six-hour training course, I had to visit the men's room seven times. <laughs> uh, my head was saying this is a good idea, but my uh, bowels were saying not so much. And so when I was done, you have to take a test. You have to take a physical test to show that you remember what to do, and then you have to take a written test to show that you remember these important things. It was a 50-point test, and I got 48 of them right, so I was able to go. The two I got wrong had to deal with what you do in an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> so I was praying there would be no emergency. And so as I'm ready to get into the plane, I put my jumpsuit on, I have the canopy on my back, and I'm ready to get into the plane, and I'm wearing a helmet, and in the side of the helmet there's a pocket. And my instructor, whose name was Tim, takes something and he puts it in the side of my helmet. And it was a radio. And I thought, oh, how, how nice that when I'm falling from 14,000 feet, screaming my head off, <laughs> they know. And if I have any questions, I can ask, and they'll be able to tell me. And I said, well, God, put the radio in. Now we can talk to each other. And he said, no way. <laughs> you don't understand. This is a one-way radio. And this is what he said next. You have nothing to say to us. And I thought, what? I'm a brand new skydiver. I mean, I've never done this before. 
I'm falling from 14,000 feet and I have nothing you want me need to hear? He goes, no. He said, your job is to listen. <laughs> and I got to thinking about that. And I thought, how often in scary moments, in moments of crisis, in moments of stress, we want to do all the talking to God. We want to tell Him what He needs to do. We have all these questions that we need answered. And God says, no, no, your job is to listen. That's right. Your job is to go into my word, hear what I said, pack it in your brain and in your heart, and listen to that. It's counterintuitive, but it's by far the healthiest approach and the safest approach. That when we feel like we're falling and troubles are all around us, we want to tell God what to do. But we need to act just the opposite. Psalm 32, 8. That, excuse me, <coughs> that Jake read a moment ago. You have said, I will teach you the way that you should go, and I will keep my eye on you and guide you along safe paths. Let me tell you why I chose that verse right after my skydiving story. Because as soon as I jumped out of the airplane and got to the place where I was to deploy my canopy, um, my instructor was on the ground watching me. And he said, all right, Rick, give me a left turn. Give him a left turn. Give me a right turn. Give him a right turn. I knew that he had his eye on me. And nothing was going to distract him from that. And because he had his eye on me, I knew he would guide me safely down. Psalm 32, 8, I will keep my eye on you and guide you along safe paths. God is that instructor saying, I got this. Amen. Just trust me, I got this. Just listen, I got this. There's an old poem that I love called, He Maketh No Mistake. Listen to this. My father's way may twist and turn, my heart may throb and ache. But in my soul, I'm glad I know, he maketh no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray, my hopes may fade away, but still I'll trust the Lord to lead, for he does know the way. Though night be dark and it may seem that day will never break, I'll pin my faith, my all on him. He maketh no mistake. There's so much now I cannot see, my eyesight's far too dim, but come what may, I'll simply trust and leave it all to him. For by and by the mist will lift, and plain it all he'll make. Through all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake. Amen. 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 All right. The third thing in our passage this morning to extract. Life is hard, but God is good. Amen. We have a good God. He's Amen. a magic. As one person described God's style of how he deals with us as a good God, he calls it ironic. And here's what he means. It would seem that a more straightforward approach for God would be to respond with each new problem with an immediate solution. A woman gets sick, sick God heals her. A man is falsely in prison, God releases him. But rarely, however, does God use such an approach. As an author of great subtlety, God lets the plot line play out in perilous ways and then ingeniously incorporates those apparent detours into the route home. That's why Joseph can look back on his harrowing life and say to his cruel brothers, you intended to harm me, mm -hmm. but God yeah. meant it for good. Amen. Although Joseph never denied his horrible past, nor minimized the trauma, he ultimately saw it as a part of a meaningful story that served purposes greater than he could imagine at the time. We're going through something unprecedented and traumatic, and it seems like it's bad. And I'm not denying that there are difficult and bad aspects of it. And that would be silly and unrealistic for me to say that. But could it be that if we trust God, somehow he's going to 
make us all somehow come out better in the end because of it. Amen. I believe so. That's right. Amen. I think we have promises in the Bible that assure us yes. that God knows how to take back things and make them good. One person who has testified that life is hard and God is good in spite of these uh, difficulties we face is the well-known author and paraplegic Johnny Erickson Tata. Yeah. You've heard of Johnny Erickson Tata before? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you have it, let me just briefly tell you who she is. She's a, uh, an incredible artist, author, and speaker. But as a teenager, Christian author, artist, and speaker, I should add, as a teenager, a few months after her accident, she was contemplating her future through this fog of despair and confusion. And she, she didn't know how she could serve God from a wheelchair, unable to feed herself, get dressed, or even make it through a day without intimate personal assistance. Mm -hmm. And she writes, you cannot imagine the shame and humiliation. What possible good could come from such a tragedy? Mm -hmm. But now, all these years later, Johnny looks back on the day she broke her neck, diving into the Chesapeake Bay. And you know what she calls that day? Hang on to the edges of your seat. This is what she calls that day. In her words, the best day of my life. Amen. What? How? Because she allowed God to work with her and through her and in her to redeem a tragedy to produce something good out of something bad. Amen. God is the ultimate skilled master at taking something bad and turning it to something good. We have a saying it says that when life gives you lemons, what do you do? Make lemonade. Make lemonade. Guess what? In that analogy, God owns the whole lemonade factory. Amen. Amen. He specializes in transforming even the worst of events into something that we could have never seen coming. No one ever guessed that Jesus' crucifixion would actually accomplish the salvation of the world. Amen. The early martyr's death, guess what happened? It was the seeds that made the church grow. Yes. In God's hands, he promises that our grief will turn to joy. Mm -hmm. And even our own very death itself is simply a prelude or a transition, if you will, into our ultimate victory that Christ has given us, Amen. our resurrection. Amen. That's right. Amen. Well, don't ever sell God short. He knows what he's doing. Yes. Amen. Yeah, life is hard, but God is good. Amen. Life is hard, but God is faithful. Yes. Life is hard, and make no mistake, God is with us. Amen. We're going to close now with that same passage we started with. So I, I'd like for you to go ahead and open up again um, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. But we're going to do this as kind of a, a litany reading. In other words, I'm going to read the first part of the verse that talks about the bad stuff that's happening. And when I read the bad stuff, I'm going to pause, and I want you at that point to say, God is Life is hard. But then I'm going to read the but after it, okay, or the good part after it, and I'm going to pause, and at that point I want you to say, God is good. God is good. You got it, okay? Got the idea? Yeah. Let's practice one. Everywhere we go, we have trouble. Life, Life is hard. But we're not discouraged. God is good. Perfect. You got it. Let's go on. We're perplexed. Life is hard. But we don't give up. God is good. We're persecuted. Life is hard. But never abandoned. God is good. We are struck down. Life is hard. But not destroyed. God is good. We have faced death for the Lord Jesus many times, and the scars on our bodies show it. Life is hard. But we're still alive, which testifies to the resurrection power of Christ to deliver us from death. God is good. While we are constantly being persecuted and threatened with imprisonment and execution, Life is hard. The power of Christ can be seen sustaining our bodies. God is good. So while death stalks us everywhere, life is hard. New life is working in us. God is good. Even though physically we're wearing out, life is hard. And every day new life and determination spring up inside of us. God is good. The few troubles we're having at this moment, 
Life is hard. Are not to be compared with the far more important, glorious future. God is good. What we see around us is temporary and will soon be destroyed. Life is hard. But that which can't be seen now will last forever, and everybody said, But God is good. Amen. 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 Don't forget, if you're on this side, we would ask you to go out that door. If you're on this side, we ask you to go out this door. And your Sabbath school quarterlies and books are here uh, on the table. And for your offering, please just drop it in the plate on your way out. Uh, for our closing prayer, uh, pray with me. May the Lord watch between me and thee when we're absent, one from another. Amen. 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 God bless you. See you next week. Amen. And if you're going to come, please RSVP.